she called me about a week later and she said, my psychiatrist wants to know what you did to me because I'm not depressed anymore. And he doesn't understand why. And my friends don't recognize me. They say, you're a different person. So sometimes you can do things when people are in a mental state where they're sort of cutting loose the usual ways, they, the assumptions they've made that continue to harm and damage them, and seeing things from a different point of view and allow themselves to experience emotion that is reconstructive. You know, it isn't just more self-blame and guilt. It's a capacity to have deep affection for the person they were and connect with themselves in a different way. Hello, my geeselings. It is Mother Goose Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 113. And this episode is with David Spiegel, who is Wilson Professor of Medicine and Associate Chair of Psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. So David did his undergraduate work at Yale, and he received his MD from Harvard Medical School. And because of the the nature of the topic of this episode, which I think will probably raise a lot of people's hackles just because of its associations with parapsychology and mystics and maybe even comedians, I have to stress that David could not be more highly qualified. He could hardly be more published. He's written over 10 books, close to 500 articles, around 200 book chapters, and a lot more. And David is highly regarded as one of the most creative psychiatrists in the field. And this has been confirmed by my own psychiatrist who is many states away and has no investment in this podcast whatsoever. And he's worked in a wide or on a wide array of topics uh, within the discipline. So that topic, however, what we discuss in this episode is David's pioneering work in hypnotherapy, as David is the world's leading hypnotherapist and hypnotherapy researcher, uh, an interest that he inherited from his father, Herbert Spiegel. And more particularly, because I will leave the introduction, the description, the explanation all to David, we discuss the origins of hypnotherapy, its relationship to hypnosis in popular culture, how therapeutic interventions, not just hypnotherapeutic, but also some others, how they fare compared to pharmaceutical interventions for mental illness. We talk about how hypnosis can be used to treat various mental disorders like PTSD or eating disorders or even more common issues that everybody faces at some point or another like stress or insomnia. And in that same vein, we also talk about how self-hypnosis can be a useful tool in everybody's mental health arsenal. So, Some background that might be useful is David's book, which he co-wrote with his father called Trance and Treatment, Clinical Uses of Hypnosis, which lays out all the fundamentals of hypnotherapy. It's a really great resource. It's what I used uh, to prepare for the conversation. And you should also check out Reverie, which is an app that David is the founder of. And it's a self-hypnosis application. It's on your smartphone. And it can guide you through a wide variety of modules that will help improve your sleep, your concentration, your eating habits, and many other facets of life. I used it or have been using it for sleep. And it's been really neat and really helpful. And toward the end of the episode, David and I talk a lot more about it. And you can check that out at reverie.com or just, and that's R-E-V-E-R-I, or by just searching that into the app store. And so without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with David. Most of these interviews, as you might imagine, uh, begin with me asking about my guest and often <laughs> their relationship to their work. But in your case, the right place or person to start with actually strikes me to be your father, Herbert Spiegel, who was also a psychiatrist and hypnotherapist and a collaborator of yours. And I was wondering, 
and this seems quite obvious, but was it his influence that made you want to be a psychiatrist and hypnotherapist in the first place? Well, the only yeah, honest uh, psychoanalytically oriented answer would be yes and no, of course. Uh, I did it despite his being a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And my mother, my late mother, Natalie Shainis, who also was a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And so uh, they used to joke that uh, it was fine with them if I became any kind of psychiatrist I wanted to be. And uh, I took them up on it. Um, the uh, And I remember my father saying to me once, you know, sometimes the hardest choices to make are the ones that seem the most obvious. You know, why wouldn't you be a psychiatrist? I... Um, I was always interested in people. The dinner table conversations were very interesting. Um, I heard my father, um, whoops, uh, something flashed there. I heard my father um, I, uh, you know, talk about his patients and watched him make an occasional movie about a patient who had um, pseudo seizures and he could start it with hypnosis and bring it to a close with hypnosis. And so when I went to medical school, I took a hypnosis course. And uh, the experience that I think turned the corner for me um, was when I was on my pediatrics rotation at Harvard Medical School. And my nur the nurse said, um, your next patient, Spiegel, is down the hall in room 346. And uh, I followed the sound of the wheezing down the hall. And uh, there was this 15-year-old girl, bolt upright in bed, knuckles white, struggling for breath. She'd been twice unresponsive to subcutaneous epinephrine. The next step was going to be general anesthesia and then starting her on steroids. Her mother is standing there crying. I didn't know what to do, and I had just started my hypnosis course. So I thought, well, why not? So I said, would you like to learn a breathing exercise? And she nodded. And um, I then realized once I got her hypnotized that we hadn't gotten to asthma in the course yet. So I just made something up. I said, each breath you take will be a little deeper and a little easier. And within about five minutes, she's lying back in bed. She's not wheezing anymore. Her mother stopped crying. The nurse ran out of the room. And my intern comes looking for me. And I figure he's going to pat me on the back and say, what the hell did you do, Spiegel? And he said, the nurse has filed a complaint with the nursing supervisor that you violated Massachusetts law by hypnotizing a minor without parental consent. Now, Massachusetts has a lot of weird laws, as you might imagine, but that's not one of them. <clears throat> and he said, so you're going to have to stop doing this. And I said, why? He said, it's dangerous. I said, you're going to give her general anesthesia and put her on steroids, and you think my talking to her is dangerous? You know, I don't think so. And he said, well, you have to stop doing it. I said, well, look, you have the right to take me off the case, but as long as she's my patient, I'm not going to tell her something I know is not true. So he stormed out, and the chief resident, the attending, and my intern had a council of war over the weekend, and they came up with a radical solution to the problem. They said, let's ask the patient. You know, I don't think they'd ever done that before. And she said, oh, I like this. Now, she'd been hospitalized every month for three months in status asthmaticus. She did have one subsequent hospitalization, but then went on to study to be a respiratory therapist. And I figured that anything that could help a patient that much violate a non-existent Massachusetts law and frustrate the head nurse had to be worth looking into. And so I could see how just the way people manage their own stress can make a huge difference in both mind and body, and I've been studying it ever since. Do you recall what year this was, around what year you had this yeah, experience? it would have been 1970. 1970? Okay, well... Just for some context, I, I found this passage in the second edition of Trance and Treatment, uh, the book you and your father wrote, you don't need to be reminded of this, uh, that jumped out at me. And it was where your father was describing how he came to practice, practice hypnotherapy. And as you know, he began studying and using hypnosis as an army psychiatrist after Pearl Harbor, and he used it to great effect. Uh, during combat in North Africa. But here's what really jumped out at me. It was that when he returned to the States, a senior analyst told him that hypnosis could tarnish his reputation as a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. And he also mentioned at this point in the book that 
Freud abandoned psychoanalysis. And my understanding not, is that Freud abandoned hypnosis, not yeah, psychoanalysis. Yeah, absolutely. That's when he That's started I mean. psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Freud sure. abandoned hypnosis. Uh, but at the time, psychoanalysis was very dominant, especially in New York. And I know your your father was at Columbia, but it was a it was fringe then. It was fringe apparently in nineteen seventy. Uh, and now you're still working on popularizing it. But how has it shifted? Why was it so uh, fringe then? And what, what has changed? Well, you know, um, to tell you the truth, I wish I, I knew. Uh, certainly when I was a resident at Mass Mental Health Center a few years later, um, I would get, you know, some grudging respect, but more often uh, things like, uh, you know, uh, you're rebelling against your father. Why are you doing this? Um, and and the same kind of thing. Freud gave it up. So who are we to use it now? There's a there's a wonderful passage in Freud's autobiography where he says, um, uh, "I was tra- helping a patient by tracing her attacks of pain back to their traumatic origins. When suddenly she awoke from the trance and threw her arms around my neck." He's, he wrote, I was modest enough not to attribute this event to my own irresistible personal attractiveness. And I discovered the mysterious element beneath hypnosis, transference. Uh, patients forming intense feelings about their therapists that are displaced from, you know, people earlier in their lives. So in order to control or el- eliminate it, I had to stop using hypnosis. So there's a couch in psychoanalysis because he was using it for hypnosis. He moved his chair around behind the head of it because he didn't like patients staring him in the eye. Now they would have their eyes open. And that began the rejection of hypnosis. Now, I don't, you know, the more I work with it, uh, Robinson, the more puzzled I am about why it remains a kind of sideshow. Um, It's the oldest Western conception of a psychotherapy. It's the first time a talking interaction between a doctor and a patient was thought to have therapeutic potential. It clearly helps people with problems like pain, anxiety, stress, insomnia, stopping smoking, eating disorders, pseudo-seizures like the one we talked about. And yet somehow people either find it uh, trivial or dangerous. You know, it's one extreme to the other. I thought at the beginning of my career, and one reason I left Boston and Harvard came here to Stanford was um, that I felt there was too much theoretical rigidity there and that my continuing to work using hypnosis would not be welcome. And that I think was true there. And Stanford was more open. They, you know, they didn't exactly, you know, strew roses in your path, but they made it possible. If you can figure out how to study it, if you can raise money to study it, to do research on it, you publish good papers on it, go for it, whatever it is. And, and I thought that building more of a scientific base, along with colleagues who have done similar things, that, you know, build it and they will come. People will recognize it. And I'm, I'm kind of giving up on that approach because we've done that. You know, we know what's happening in the brain. We've done randomized clinical trials that shows that it's effective. Um, and the general position of uh, the medical profession and the use of the, of the technique hasn't changed very much. So I thought, I'm going to go direct to consumer. You know, So that's why we started Reverie and, um, as a way of making what we do in the office of it freely and widely available to people uh, who want help. And so uh, you know, I think there are other reasons. Uh, you know, One is there isn't a whole lot of money to be made teaching people a skill like this versus selling medications. And I'm a doctor. I use meds with my patients when I think they're appropriate, but um, I, the financial incentives are not in favor of hypnosis either. So it's a combination of, you know, stage show hypnosis and bad reputation for weird things about it. I also think, to be honest, that it scares people a little, that you can actually so quickly change your perspective. Um, and people do that with or without hypnosis, but I think it scares them a little, and that's part of the problem too. Yeah, I imagine that two reasons, two reasons that come to mind that you didn't mention for why it might remain a bit on the fringe is one, its associations with the occult, and then another is uh, trickery. 
people think that there's some sort of uh, trickery going on. Yeah. Well, it has been associated with a lot of weird things, but you know, <laughs> you know, so are medications, snake oil, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Somehow it hasn't tarnished meds and, you know, and you know, half a million Americans have died of drug overdoses in the last 10 years, more deaths than from guns. And God knows that's a horrible epidemic here and, and more deaths, uh, uh, than car accidents. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of been singled out because of the, these people's fears that it's some kind of weird occult thing, which it isn't. Um, or the people are, I think, scared about the idea that someone can sort of take over their mind and make them do things they don't want to do and all that. Uh, I'm thinking that we ought to call it dangerously effective. It, it, we, we published a paper recently in, in Scientific Reports, Afik Fairman and I, he's a terrific, bright postdoc, works in my lab, that when you do psychological testing, what you see happens for highly hypnotizable people is that they're cognitively flexible. Um, uh, they're, you know, there's a saying that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. There are a lot of people who, who hang on to things long past their usefulness. And people who are highly hypnotizable are more cognitively flexible. They're willing to let go and not perseverate on on points of view that really don't serve much purpose. And so I think the thing that scares people is actually one of the coolest things about hypnosis from a psychotherapeutic point of view is that you're in a mode where the way you've always done it <clears throat> or your concerns about being embarrassed if you changed or do something different tend to dissolve. And I think that makes it a terrific context for therapeutic change. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, the relationship, or you touched on it, between hypnosis and pharmaceuticals, and then money as well. And I'd like to talk a bit about psychiatry, psychotherapy, and some of, some of the problems and disorders they aim to treat. So as good physicalists, and you've already indicated this. We don't believe that depression is caused by some fu funk of the soul or in insomnia, a curse or something like that. We believe that things like depression, insomnia, eating disorders, PTSD, they're physical problems with the brain. And is there something about the different ways in which psychotherapeutic modalities like hypnosis versus uh, medications treat these problems that makes one preferable over the other in any given circumstance? So you mentioned that you, you're, you're a psychiatrist, you use medications as well. They're one tool you have at your disposal. Well, um, you know, I think part, there's a kind of intellectual confusion that's part of the problem, Robinson, and, and it is this. The idea that the biological is the scientific and the psychological is not. It's sort of spiritual and weird and all this stuff. But, you know, our major advantage as creatures, the things that allowed us to evolve and to spoil the planet, have to do mostly with the three pounds of material on the top of our shoulders, you know, uh, that we can think and feel and plan, form social relationships, that's what's allowed us to survive. The human infant has the longest period of profound dependency of any creature. If there weren't a social and loving network surrounding them, we, we wouldn't survive. So uh, the idea that the only scientific treatments are the biological ones is just wrong. Um, you can do something that's very scientific, but it's psychological. You can help people to use their brains differently. You can I can teach people how to turn down activity in the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, the salience network, so that they're less likely to be distracted by threat or noise or discontinuities of one kind or another. So psychosocial treatment is every bit as scientific as pharmacological treatment, but we don't think of it that way. And I'm sure that some of your listeners, even as I say that, are thinking, wait a minute, that's different. But you know what it isn't? You can do good science on any aspect of psychiatric and psychological treatment. And so... Um, the, there's this idea that we're, uh, that, that somehow the, the talking cures are less scientific or less realistic or less likely to help than the biological ones. And that's simply a profound misconception.
Mm -hmm. Right. And how over time has our understanding of the brain on a neurological level changed the psychotherapeutic methods we use to treat its disorders? Well, I think when when you study them properly, uh, they uh, provide legitimacy for the psychotherapeutic methods so that you can show that um, you can turn down activity in parts of the limbic system that trigger anger or fear, for example. And you do that with cognitive behavioral therapy. There have been studies that did, there were PET scan, PET scan studies of the, the behavioral treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder that show effects on parts of the, uh, the, the brain that provide cognitive reinforcement for obsessional activity and reduction in anxiety. Um, uh, we've shown using hypnosis that we can turn down aspects of the pain processing region in the salience network, in the insula, in the dorsal anterior cingulate, and in somatosensory cortex when you hypnotize people and teach them how to control or eliminate pain. Um, so the, the science has helped us level the playing field a bit and show that um, there are things you can do psychologically that have what people would call real neurobiological outcome. Um, so, you know, that's just a fact, but it's a fact that doesn't get much respect. And, uh, you know, I think we're beginning to learn from studies of meditation, which show that you turn down activity in the posterior cingulate cortex, which is the part of the default mode network where you reflect on who you are and what you are, that people who learn to meditate really get over themselves. They really see things from a non-self-focused perspective. That's what it's supposed to do, and that's what it seems to do when you look at what's happening in their brain. So, you know, uh, blocking uh, serotonin reuptake is one way to treat depression, but helping people to re to to face and reprocess the meaning of traumatic experiences psychologically and with techniques like hypnosis uh, is also very effective. There was a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences some years ago. It was a big combined psychotherapy and antidepressant medication study for depression. And the overall finding um, uh, was that um, the, the, the combination worked better than either one alone. Well, that's, you know, not surprising, but it fits with what I'm telling you. But they also found that people who had a history of childhood physical or sexual abuse did much better with psychotherapy than medication. And people who didn't did much better with medication than psychotherapy. So it suggests that even when you get the same overall outcome, uh, there are certain kinds of problems that are dealt with better by psychotherapy than medication. Hmm. Is it because certain problems require, I'd say, getting at the, the very human root at the problem to resolve it rather than just treating something that's wrong with the brain, some dysfunction? Well, uh, that's a good that's a good way to put it. I think it is true that uh, um, there are some sorts of problems that don't get to the point where um, you know you're just depleted of energy and optimism, and uh, you don't sleep well and you don't eat well, and you're just depressed. And it maybe sometimes you need something to to just kind of elevate your levels of energy and get you to the point where you can think through what's what's troubling you. And there are others that have real human implications. It's interesting that, by and large, for post-traumatic stress disorder, there's there's not much in the way of pharmacology. I mean, recently, uh, there have been some very interesting studies with MDMA, with ecstasy, uh, showing that people have one or two of these psychotherapy-guided trips with the drug, and they feel a whole lot better. They feel it was a profound experience. And... and it's interesting that ecstasy, which is sort of the social connection psychedelic, uh, people tend to feel more intensely connected with one another when they're on it, is useful with PTSD because many people with PTSD feel shame. They feel frightened of other people. They feel, even if they it was in no way their fault, most people who have been traumatized blame themselves somehow for not having predicted that it would happen or not having done something else when it did happen. Denying the, the the loss of agency, the loss of control that is the key element of post of trauma, 
And and so a, a drug that facilitates social connection seems to be actually helpful for for people with PTSD. So, you know, we're not we're not purely physical beings. We're not purely psychological beings. We're both, and it makes sense that either psychotherapies or medications that can help in the other domain can be more helpful. Yeah, post traumatic stress was stress disorder was exactly the example I was going to go to because it is a disorder that typically has, as far as I understand it, a very clear root in an experience or a sequence of experiences that are traumatic. And I know that you've done a lot of work on PTSD. Now, you've described, I think, the the phenomenology of post-traumatic stress a bit and the symptoms, but maybe we could dive a bit deeper into it. What is going on in the brain of somebody with PTSD? How does it change? How does their brain change uh, before and after uh, the onset of the disorder? Well, we've we've uh, looked at the literature involving PET and MRI studies, of, and, and what you see is two related but different kinds of changes. So in one case, you have inhibition of the medial prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that thinks, that plans, uh, and that can inhibit emotion. And so what you tend to see in the more common hyperarousal kind of PTSD is that they have trouble planning, relating to people, but they're irritable. Uh, they get set off real, real easily. Uh, they'll find themselves yelling at people they love and doing things that they don't, they feel badly about later on. Um, they get into drugs to try and calm their affective instability. But you have a kind of uh, explosion of emotion and inhibition of thought uh, in the standard hyperarousal PTSD. So there's, they have intrusive thoughts about uh, the traumatic event. Um, they avoid stimuli that may remind them of it. Uh, they have this kind of negative view of themselves and what's left of their future. Um, uh, this, the other change, though, in a subgroup now, it's a subtype of PTSD, is called the dissociative subtype. These are people who are hypoemotional and who have elevated activity in the medial prefrontal cortex. So they're constantly inhibiting emotion rather than allowing it to, to flourish. Um, and these people have trouble just even sometimes accessing memories. They may forget huge amounts of what happened during the traumatic event. Um, many rape victims experience the rape as if they're floating above their bodies feeling sorry for the woman that's being assaulted below. Um, and it, it puts them in a situation where it's hard for them to face, understand, and work through what really happened and the implications of the, of the trauma. And when they can do it, they, they can make a change. I had a, a patient recently who, who migrated from a country that is famous for not treating women very well, managed to become a healthcare professional here, but was chronically depressed and miserable. And she told me that she just, you know, she, she retired early. She just felt bad and her friends all saw her as depressed as well as her psychiatrist. And they were having trouble treating her with meds wasn't helping all that much. And I said, well, th th what kind of trauma did you experience in part that led you to leave? She said, when I was 12 years old, I was raped by my landlord and my parents were afraid to do anything about it because they were afraid we'd be thrown out of the building. And I discovered growing up as a teenager after that, that my body wasn't my own, that men felt free to say and do anything they wanted on the streets. It was terrible. So I, I got it. She was very hypnotizable. And I had her picture, I said, I want you to be your own mother. I want you to picture yourself as a 12-year-old girl after you've been assaulted. And she started to cry. And I said to her, was it her fault? And she said, no, she's a sweet little girl. And then she said, I'm stroking her hair. I'm stroking her hair. And cried some more. And But was able to recognize that this sort of shaming that is often done of uh, sexual assault survivors was just flat out wrong. And that part of how bad she felt about herself was carrying on this myth that somehow a 12-year-old girl had induced sexual assault from this rapist landlord. 
Um, and she called me about a week later and she said, my psychiatrist wants to know what you did to me because I'm not depressed anymore. And he doesn't understand why. And my friends don't recognize me. They say, you're a different person. So sometimes you can do things when people are in a mental state where they're sort of cutting loose the usual ways, they, the assumptions they've made that continue to harm and damage them, and seeing things from a different point of view and allow themselves to experience emotion that is reconstructive. You know, it isn't just more self-blame and guilt. It's a capacity to have deep affection for the person they were and connect with themselves in a different way. Well, I think at this point it would be a very good idea to more explicitly lay out just what hypnotism or hypnotherapy more properly is and what it isn't. You you indicated this earlier, but I noticed in the book, um, Trans and Treatment, that you and your father don't think of hypnosis itself as a therapy, but something that facilitates some other therapeutic strategy. And I think that that's very clear in the story that you just told. That's right. I'm, I'm glad you, you saw it that way. Uh, yes, um, hypnosis is simply a mental state of highly focused attention. It's like getting so caught up in a good movie that you forget you're watching the movie, you enter the imagined world. And that world comes to seem real for a while. So sometimes you get caught up in a movie. You don't judge it. You just say, well, you know, you're, you're sort of swept along with it. And later on, you may think, well, you know, that wasn't so plausible. And I didn't like the lead actor and whatever. But at the time, you're not judging it. You're just experiencing it. To do that, you put outside of conscious awareness things that ordinarily would be in conscious. Now, we do that all the time. I can see you've got your back resting against the chair. Hopefully, you weren't even aware of the sensations in your back touching. And if you were, we can just stop the interview now. Um, we do that all the time. Our brain is very good at paying attention to what we want to and putting outside of conscious awareness things we don't. Where do you don't want? So dissociation, in a in a stronger sense, is one of the things that accompanies the narrowness of focal attention and hypnosis. And the third thing, the thing that scares people the most that goes along with it is what used to be called suggestibility, but it's really cognitive flexibility. And we're seeing that you're able, in order to immerse yourself in a new point of view, to just cut loose the normal assumptions you've made about the situation, like my patient did, where the normal assumptions she had made for decades about herself just weren't banging on the door for attention. She was allowing herself to experience herself as a 12-year-old in a totally different way. And so it's, it's a matrix within which lots of different therapeutic approaches can be used. So that's why my late father and I said there is no hypnotherapy. There's a state of hypnosis that can be a powerful and useful matrix framework for a psychotherapeutic approach, but not any one. It's not a hypnotherapy. It's teaching people how to take advantage of their own uh, ability and then use it for a therapeutic purpose. You know, uh, uh, Plato said teaching and learning is all remembrance. That is, what you do is not do something to someone. You help them discover their own capacity. And so we start out every session measuring people's hypnotizability. It varies. And I have a much better idea of the way in which to work with someone when I know how hypnotizable they are. Hmm. This contrast between framing it as su suggestibility and cognitive flexibility uh, is really striking to me. So we have this idea of suggestibility as one in which the mind becomes something of a, a blank slate in which you're very vulnerable and can just be reprogrammed. And as opposed to flexibility, the, the, the idea of which I find a very empowering, there's this idea in the zeitgeist that you lose all agency during hypnosis, and that would not facilitate a therapeutic outcome. Well, that's a very nice way of framing it, and I think you're right that uh, you can see it as a uh, an opportunity rather than a weakness or a liability, um, and uh, it gives people a chance 
to see old problems from from a new point of view. Um, hypnosis does teach you something about agency, however, and that is we are our our agency is another one of our attributes that we use it more sometimes than others. You know, so um, uh, I I had a patient yesterday who said, you know. Within a few minutes, I, while I was testing her hypnotizability, her hand was up in the air. She said, I just don't feel like I have agency over my left hand. I do over my right hand because that wasn't the instructed one. And I think it's a, I, I was on Andrew Huberman's, the Huberman Lab podcast, and one of the things I did was measure his hypnotizability. Uh, and there's a YouTube video of it. And here's this brilliant neuroscientist looking at his hand and saying, what the hell is going on here? So... It does teach you that agency is a brain-mediated event that can be altered, and that's pretty interesting, you know. And we've all had these, you know. It seemed like a good idea at the time experiences, you know, where we went along with something that later on we thought, "What the hell was I thinking?" You know. So it it's useful to study how agentic your brain can be in different circumstances and learn from that. Mm-hmm. Now, I asked you when we we started talking more explicitly about hypnosis, what it is and what it isn't. And I think I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't ask you this question that I just find very personally curious, what the relationship is between what you do in hypnotherapy and the sorts of comedic gag hypnosis episodes that we're more familiar with, where uh, some hypnotist goes on a comedy show gets people in the audience to dance like chickens or things like that. And they, they claim to have no idea of what's happening, no remembrance, no memory of it, things of this sort. You know, you know, what you make me think in asking that question, Robinson is somehow we don't have the same uh, reaction to what people do when they get drunk at a party or get high on drugs and the use of alcohol or drugs as we do with hypnosis. I mean, there are a lot of things that can modulate your agency, disinhibit you, and get you to do things you wouldn't otherwise do. But somehow it seemed as a, it's seen as a more intrinsic vulnerability or liability of hypnosis than it is of a lot of things we do. I mean, every culture in the world uses mind-altering substances of one kind or another. And there are always times when people want to let go and not be who they usually are. That's why we go on vacations. You know, you're in a different setting, you act differently. So we like to dissociate and reconsolidate ourselves and act differently. But somehow with hypnosis, you know, the, the football coach dancing like a ballerina is the kind of thing we see. Now, there is a certain amount of trickery. To that. And the trickery is this, that in, in these stage shows, they don't just take the first two people out of the audience and get them to do all this stuff because they can't. What they do is some initial techniques. They'll like they'll be leaning back and forth while they're talking to the audience and they'll look for people in the audience who are starting to sway back and forth with them, or they'll bring them up on stage and try a few things and see if they'll go along with it or not. So the first half of any of these shows involves calling from the audience the people who are the most highly hypnotizable. And then you can do, you know, lie flat between two chairs and I'll sit on you, that kind of stuff. You can't do it with most people. So they make it, they, they give the impression that everyone is that vulnerable uh, to, uh, manipulation using hypnosis. And the interesting thing is many of those people, they're vulnerable to manipulation without using hypnosis too. You know, they're the kind of people who can too easily see it from the other person's point of view. And, you know, if you think that this is just a function of hypnosis, pure hypnosis, think about the fact that 75% of Republicans think that Trump won the election. You know, we are social creatures susceptible of social influence, including of things that obviously are not true. So it's, um, it's something where hypnosis gets the bad rap, but frankly, it's a part of the human condition. Hmm. It's funny, you, you bring up the next topic that I, I wanted to get into. So we're clearly in sync, which is good. Maybe I'm hypnotizable in, in some way, but I, I was going to and ask. Hypnotized, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to ask, what hypnotizability is? Is it synonymous with cognitive flexibility? And is there, I mean, you've already said really implicitly that there is variation in hypnotizability, but what does this correlate to in the brain? 
um, we've studied that. We've taken a group of Stanford students, extremely high and extremely low in hypnotizability. We measured them, put them in the scanner before we asked them to do anything hypnotic. And we found that what typified people who were highly hypnotizable is higher functional connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the left, that's part of the executive control network, and the dorsal anterior cingulate on the right, which is part of the salience network. So it means that for those people, thinking and the and feeling are more closely interconnected, and they're less likely to be distracted because uh, they're less likely to let the salience network impair their ability to concentrate on something. And, and so uh, the functional connectivity simply means that when one area is active, the other area is active. When one is inactive, the other is. So there's this coordinated activity in high hypnotizables that you don't see in low hypnotizables. We found that there's a genetic component to that. Uh, and uh, my colleagues and I just published a paper uh, in which... Um, we looked at a, 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 a gene, the catechol o methyltransferase gene, which is involved in metabolizing dopamine, one of the leading neurotransmitters in the brain. And uh, we found that um, a particular polymorphism of that gene was associated with higher hypnotizability. Um, and so we actually now have a point of care test where we could take a sample and very quickly analyze whether or not you turn out to be more likely to be highly hypnotizable and then choose that. Uh, as a therapeutic uh, intervention. So it was my, my lab and, and Dr. Wangs uh, and uh, Jesse Markovitz um, uh, uh, who, who worked together on um, developing this test. And so we now know that there's a genetic component as well as neurobiological signature um, that, that are associated with higher hypnotizability. When you started answering that question, you said you take you took a group of Stanford students, some that were highly hypnotizable, some that were not. And this uh, presupposes for me that you are you know how to measure hypnotizability. So I'm wondering, one, how, yeah, how do you measure hypnotizability? And this closely relates to another question that we haven't uh, gotten into yet, but that's of the utmost important. Just how do you hypnotize someone? Well, first of all, Dana Cortad was the actually the lead author on that genetic paper, and she got intrigued by the uh, possibility of a genetic test for hypnotizability. We the there are a number of measures. One of the scales is the hypnotic induction profile, um, which is in trance and treatment, and which we yeah, you and your it father about, came up with it, right? right? And so it's a, a brief structured test where you give people instructions um, to after they've looked up, closed their eyes, take a deep breath, to let their hand float up in the air like a balloon. And you instruct them that even if you pull it down, it'll float right back up to the upright position. We can try it if you want to see how hypnotizable you are. Uh, we have a hypnotizability test on Reverie too, uh, but that's doable if you want. Um, and there are some people who will respond very quickly and they'll pull the hand down, it'll float back up. They'll feel less control over that hand compared to the other. And there are others who don't. For a moment, it, they, they don't sort of know what you're talking about, and they are less hypnotizable. And you can rate people on a zero to 10 scale of hypnotizability. To do the study that I mentioned, we started out with a group form of a different hypnotizability measure, the Harvard uh, Group Susceptibility, Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale. So I gave talks and, you know, measured hundreds of people, and then we selected the ones at the high or low ends and gave them a second test to be sure that they were either high or low in hypnotizability. Hmm. Yeah, so you you just mentioned <laughs> testing how hypnotizable I am. And my instinctive response is that, and I think that this is an interesting question, and it, or it raises one in its own right, is it is that it wouldn't be valid if we tried to do it right now because I'm at, I'm already at a, a state of pretty high arousal being in this conversation. But naturally, that brings us back to that first story you told. Uh, I think you said you were in your residency when that happened in mm -hmm. 1970. Hey, I was uh, a medical, medical student, yeah. Medical student. And this girl was clearly in a state of very high arousal, but your uh, treatment 
was quite effective. So maybe the level of arousal isn't as important as I would think it is. Yeah, no, it isn't because hypnosis is not sleep. It's a state of highly focused attention. You're out waking, you're, they're waking them up when you're going into hypnosis. They're okay, concentrating well, very intently. Yeah. In, in that case, if you think it would be worthwhile to see how hypnotizable I am, I'd be interested. Sure. Okay. Let's give it a try. So get as comfortable as you can. You have armrests on your chair there. Yeah, I've got good. armrests. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to give you some instructions about your eyes and are you right or left-handed? Left-handed. Left-handed. Okay. Nobody tried to switch you, I hope, when you were a kid. To the, no, uh, they did my mom, though, which is interesting. They they forced her. Yeah. It's bad. Does she have any dyslexia at all? Does she? Uh, no, she doesn't, as far as good. I know. Well, but it's, uh, it's bad. It confuses kids. It's a bad thing to do. You know, you should just go with your dominance, and it's nice that your your mom knew better than to try and switch you. That's good for her. Um. So uh, I'm going to concentrate on your right hand and arm, on your dominant hand. So get as comfortable as you can. <clears throat> on one, do one thing. Look up. Keep your head still, but look up past your eyebrows. All the way up. Keep looking up. That's good. And while you keep looking up, slowly close your eyes. Close, close, close. Good. Now let your breath out. Let your eyes relax, but keep them closed and let your body float. Imagine your body floating down, floating into the chair. And while you concentrate on your body floating into the chair, I'm going to concentrate on your right hand and arm. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to take your left hand and stroke the back of the middle finger of your right hand, and you can go ahead and do that now. Stroke gently down toward your knuckles, the back of your right hand, and along your forearm all the way to your right elbow. And feel a sense of tingling and numbness and lightness. And now let your right hand float up in the air like a balloon as you put your left hand back. Let your right hand float up in the air like a balloon. Good. Now let it rest in a comfortable, upright position. Either the way you have it positioned up in the air now, or you can rest your elbow on the chair if you want. And I'm going to give you this instruction. Your hand will remain light and in this upright position, even after I give you the signal for your eyes to open. Later, if I ask you to pull your right hand back down and then let go, it will float right back up to the upright position. You'll find something pleasant and amusing about this sensation. Later, if I ask you to touch your right elbow, your usual sensation and control will return. Each time you go into this state of concentration, you'll find it easier and easier to do, and you can use it to help you concentrate on what's important to you. You can find it relaxing, for example, by just inhaling through your nose about halfway, hold, and now fill your lungs completely, and slowly exhale through your mouth. Inhale through your nose, halfway. Hold. Now fill your lungs. And then slowly exhale through your mouth. So notice how quickly and easily you can use your store of memories and your imagination to help yourself and your body feel better. Right now we'll come out of the state of self-hypnosis by counting backwards from three to one. On three, you'll get ready. On two, with your eyelids closed, roll up your eyes. One, let your eyes open, and that will be the end of the exercise. Ready? Three, two, one. Good. Now stay in this position, and please describe what physical sensations you're aware of now in your right hand and arm. Pretty much only a little bit of soreness and muscle tension in the outside of my right shoulder, the rear delt. Okay. Delta. The rear delt. Uh, is it comfortable? Any tingling sensation? Yeah, there's a there's some tingling in my right hand. Does your right hand feel as if it's not as much a part of your body as your left hand? Okay, good. Now, please take your left hand 
pull your right hand down and then let go. Now turn your head, look at your right hand and watch what's going to happen. And as you look at your right hand, just imagine it to be a big, buoyant balloon. <laughs> and as Am you I imagine it... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask if I was forgetting an instruction. No, that's fine. As you imagine it to be a balloon, permit it to act out as if it were a balloon. Be big about it. Can you describe what that feels like? It feels like it's rising. It's rising. Does that surprise you at all? A little bit. It does right, feel so nice and at home up here. Feels at home up there. Yeah. Okay. And that maybe is a little surprising. But... By way of comparison, please raise your left hand. All right, put your left hand down. Are you aware of a relative difference in sensation in your right hand going up compared to your left? Yeah, I would say that my right hand feels like it could be like comfortable there for a while. Comfortable. My left hand didn't for a while. really feel that way. Didn't feel that way. So are you aware of a relative difference in your sense of control over one hand going up compared to the other? yes in a sense yeah i definitely had to force my left hand up my right yeah. hand just feels like it would stay up there so you got it way up over your head and it just feels like it yeah. could stay there. I, i'm not really thinking about it at all so it's it's lighter than the left hand is that right are you aware of a relative difference in your sense of control over one hand going up compared to the other Yes, I mean, I, I, I definitely had to more consciously will my left hand to go up, but my right hand, I just, it just feels like if I kind of forgot about it, like I'm not really thinking about it that much. It's just content to stay up there, though my shoulder is getting a little bit uh, tired, but my arm, my hand still wants to stay up there. Yeah, it was. So you're experiencing this change in your sense of agency, that your agency over the two arms is now different. It wasn't before we started. Is that right? All right. Um, now, please take your left hand and touch your right elbow. Okay, now let go. Are you aware of a difference now in sensation and control in your right handed arm? No. All right. Touch your right elbow again with your left hand. Let go. Touch the elbow itself, not just the upper arm, the elbow. That's good. Okay. okay. That does feel like there's a change now. Ah, what's the change? Oh, it kind of feels like my hand came back to me. In a strange it did. way. That's yeah. interesting. So when you touched your upper arm, it didn't. But when you touched the When elbow, I touch it, it here, it didn't. But when I touch it here, it feels Very different for sure. That's interesting. Huh. So now it, it feels like a bit more like I'm holding my hand up there. It does. Okay. Well, you can let it go down now. That's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so interesting. before you had less control over the right hand and arm. Now it's pretty much the same. Is that right? Uh, my right yeah. hand still feels like it kind of wants to do its own thing. <laughs> still does. Okay. Yeah. Well, shake both hands and tell me when the control becomes the same. Now. <laughs> okay. Now it is. So before you had less control, now it's the same. Did I do or say anything that would indicate there'd be a change in sensation or control in your right hand and arm? No. Well, wh how did you get the control back? Exerting my agency over it. 
Mm-hmm. Is how and I what got it. you? What got you to do that? Uh, your suggestion. Uh, then you remember what it was? Shake out my hand. Shake us. <laughs> okay. Um, and did you have a sense of floating lightness or buoyancy in your right hand during the test? During the test, absolutely. Um, and um, did you have that sense in any other part of your body, head, neck, thighs, abdomen, chest all over, or just your right hand and arm? Well, I did feel that way when you suggested that I imagine myself floating down into my chair. But after I started raising my, my arm, I think it was just in the arm, in the hand. Just in the arm. Okay. And well, I notably did not have it in my left hand when you asked me to raise my left hand. See, now, it's a really interesting thing. Your your score is 7 out of 10. You're, you're rather hypnotizable. Um, what I actually said to you was, when I touch your right elbow, your, when I ask you to touch your right elbow, your usual sensation and control will return. Do you remember that now? Because what you told me was it was just shaking shaking out the hand and that did it. So, you know, you, you're an intelligent man, you're carefully listening, um, but you misattributed the recovery of experience in your right arm to something that was really similar but wasn't what the instruction was. And in your case, it was very clear because before you touched your upper arm, but you didn't touch your elbow and you didn't feel the change. But when I asked you to actually touch your elbow, you did. So you dissociated your episodic memory of exactly what the instruction was from getting the implicit information that when you touch your elbow, the control will come back. And that's a, a perfect example of dissociation where it was in there, you remembered it, but you didn't remember that you remembered it. And that's something that you typically see with hypnosis. So you are quite hypnotizable. actually. Oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Does that tell you anything about my personality type? Because you, you, when when we were talking about this group of Stanford students, you mentioned some of the difference of what was going on in their in their brains that made some more hypnotizable than others. So you're on the the mid to upper range of hypnotizability. What that suggests is that you have a pretty good ability to turn down activity in the salience network, to turn down your dorsal anterior cingulate, to not be constantly worried, you know, if there's a loud noise, what does it mean? Is somebody outside doing something, you know? You you can focus, you can, and I can imagine that you're the kind of student that when you study something and you're on track, you're in it, you know, you don't let other things distract you very much. Um, also, people who are on the mid-range to high-sided hypnotizability, they, they, value experience over thought sometimes. You you like to have experiences, immerse yourself in them, and later maybe think about what they're like. Uh, they tend to make emotional connections fairly easily. They tend to see things from the other person's point of view fairly easily. So that sound, does that sound anything like you? Is that, uh, A lot of it sounds a lot like me. I, I think I'm uh, very empathetic and... I also get quite absorbed in tasks. I generally am somebody that does live in the mind more than experience. So that was the only thing that didn't entirely resonate with me. But I do like the occasional night of debauchery when... (laughs) There you go. Right. You can let yourself do it. And there are people who can't, who just can't let go that much. And you can, but you don't do it all the time. So you're on the mid-range to the high side, but not the extreme high. And uh, that would fit with, with this experience here, where you were able to reorganize your sense of agency, change sensation and control, and then recover it very quickly. So the way that you answered this question uh, regarding the personality types tells me that there is a tremendous amount of research behind this. And I mean, just the facility with which you could uh, point out all of these uh, differences in my personality. And this 
makes me wonder naturally what sort of clinical research backs up the use of hypnosis as a therapeutic modality. And one reason I'm particularly curious about this is in philosophy, there's something you're familiar with. You might've heard the name Karl Popper. Yeah. Yes. He has this logical positivism. Yeah. Yeah. He has this demarcation problem uh, for science, which is, okay, how do we separate science from everything else? And one of his examples for things that was pseudoscience is a psychoanalysis. And the reason is that psychoanalysis has this rap for being unfalsifiable. So I'm particularly curious about the sorts of experiments that are run on hypnosis, uh, the research behind it, that makes it scientific. There has been a large body of research on hypnosis. I've talked about the brain imaging studies we did, but we've done a whole bunch of clinical trials too, as have many other people. Um, So for example, um, we published a study in The Lancet in 2000 um, uh, in which we randomized 241 people to one of three conditions. They were all undergoing um, arterial cutdowns to do chemo and visualization in the liver to treat cancer or to visualize renal artery stenosis. And it's it's un, it's long, it's painful, it's anxiety provoking, and we don't use general anesthesia for it. And there were three conditions they were randomized to. One of them got standard care, which meant that they had an IV, they could push a button and give themselves opioids if they had pain or anxiety. Two, they had that plus a friendly nurse providing emotional support. And three, they had that plus uh, some a trained person teaching them to use self-hypnosis. Imagine you're going somewhere else, feel your body floating in a bath, like a hot tub or floating in space, sort of like you did. Uh, and, and you can filter the hurt out of the pain. By the end of an hour and a half, these things usually take about two and a half hours. The standard care group had pain scores were five out of 10. The nursing support scores were three out of 10, and the hypnosis scores were one out of 10. Um, In in terms of uh, anxiety, I got a little scared because the standard care groups were five out of 10, the the support three out of 10, and zero in the hypnosis groups. I was afraid they'd all died or something. Um, Their procedures got done 17 minutes faster on average uh, because not only were they more comfortable, but the medical team was more comfortable. They could see they had a a, a soothed, comfortable patient. The standard care group used twice as much opioids as the patient group, and the patient group had far fewer medical complications than the standard care group. So it got done quicker with less stress, less pain, and fewer complications. Um, Published in The Lancet, large randomized clinical trial. If I had a drug that did that, Every hospital in the country would be using it now. But, you know, it's hypnosis is still in the situation we're in. People ask me, well, does it last? Well, we've done randomized clinical trials with women with metastatic breast cancer. We meet with, meet with them weekly to deal with their fears of dying and death, how they're coping with their illness, how they communicate with loved ones. And we taught them self-hypnosis at the end of each group meeting. By the end of a year, the hypnosis group had half the pain the control group did on the same and very low amounts of pain medication. So they learned to just use it when they needed it. They get a new pain and they think, oh my God, the cancer's spreading. And then they do their self-hypnosis and just soothe themselves. Um, so there have been studies uh, by a group in Montreal uh, that uh, show that if, for pain, if you inflict pain on people uh, by using a series of shocks to the wrist, and you hypnotize them and say, your hand is in circulating ice water, it's cool, tingling and numb, filter the hurt out of the pain. They got significant pain reduction by reducing activity in somatosensory cortex, which makes sense. They did the same thing, but they said something different. They said, the pain's there, but it won't bother you, it's not important. And there they got the same amount of analgesia, but now it was reducing activity in the anterior cingulate of the salient network. So you can get the same clinical effect using a different part of the brain if you use different language. So studies like this show that it works and how it works. One thing you mentioned is the self-hypnosis, which I'm quite, I'm quite excited to get to that and to talk about 
reverie in a few minutes, but I have a, there are a few final questions I wanted to ask about hypnosis itself. And one thing I was curious about is eating disorders, because I've uh, had an eating, eating disorder myself for a long time. I think it's uh, psychotherapy has helped me deal with it a lot, but it's something that is still uh, very close to my heart and that I'm very curious about. And I'm wondering how specifically, hip, if you had a patient uh, with an eating disorder, what I had was a uh, major binge eating disorder. Uh, made, I don't use major in a, a technical sense. That's just how I would have described it. But how would you treat somebody with an eating disorder using hypnosis? Um uh, you, you look pretty healthy, so you're doing something right uh, dealing with it. Um, um, what we do, I, I had a patient yesterday who had, had a minor form of binge eating disorder. New patient, I hadn't seen her before. She It's chocolate. She just goes nuts for chocolates. So she's pretty, she eats a pretty healthy diet except when it's time for dessert and the chocolates come out and she just can't stop it. And um, what I teach people, what I taught her you know, you would think that I would teach her to try and restrict her eating of chocolate. And I said, well, why do you like eating? It tastes so good, so much flavor. I just in love with it. It's like a, a you know, a, a, a physical attraction to the sensory experience of eating the food. Um, and, and so you can relate to that. But I said that, you know, the um, what we know now about drug addiction of various kinds, like with opioids, is that you get more arousal in the mesolimbic dopamine reinforcement system in the brain from the chase than you do from the catch. The chase is better than the catch. These Definitely, people, I can empathize these, with that. So you're thinking about the next one before you the thing to eat before you eat. So in an odd way, you're actually enjoying eating less because you're so focused on, the, on getting more of it. And I said to her, so here's what I want. I'm not going to teach you not to eat. I'm going to teach you to eat and enjoy eating more while you eat less. So I had her actually picture what it felt like um, in hypnosis to eat one of those, one of her favorite chocolates. And the first thing she said after it was, and I didn't prompt her for this, she said, I feel satisfied. That's an interesting word. It wasn't how pleasurable it is or how good it is. I feel satisfied that she was able to focus on the enjoyment of the eating that she had rather than having to get more and more and more. And she surprised herself with that. So the other concept that I teach people is um, to think of your body as a trusting, innocent creature that has to take into it anything you put into it, even if it's damaged by it. Uh, and so if you have, you have like a pet, a dog or a cat or something, or did you... I have two. I have a dog and a cat. The cat is usually a co-host, but she's got a nice warm <laughs> spot with the dog. Good. So. Well, well she, she's in the show now uh, because, and, and my patient yesterday did too. She had both. And I said, would you ever force a whole bunch of food into your cat's mouth that it didn't want? She said, no. So I said, well, why do it to your body? Your body is a trusting, innocent creature. Uh, just like your dog or your cat or a baby that has to take into it anything you put into it, even if it's damaged by it. And so think of you, had, have a sense of compassion for your body. Allow it to help you enjoy what you do eat, but don't mistreat it by forcing more food into it than it wants or needs. So you, you cultivate, and she said, I feel more compassion just for my body and for what I eat. So you can enjoy eating more while you eat less. The problem isn't that you want more food. It's that you're not giving yourself a chance to enjoy the food you are eating. And if you do that, you will naturally start to feel more satisfied. So that's what we do in hypnosis. And the hypnosis intensifies that experience. You can see what it really feels like. And you can also begin to see how enjoying what you eat to a greater extent can actually help you reduce the amount you feel you need to eat because you're focusing on actually enjoying the experience of tasting and eating the food. Hmm. No, that that's all really interesting. Um, thanks for sharing that. <laughs> I appreciate it. And so one term or thesis or central point of trance and treatment that I was curious about is uh, 
the principle of restructuring. And I, I just wanted to know theoretically what the principle of restructuring is and why it's so important to how you think of hypnotherapy. Because the idea that is that, and, and this is related to something that came along later, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, that you you see an old problem from a new point of view. That um, just uh, the, I see. The, that's it. So uh, what I was presenting you was, in some ways, may have been a little surprising to you. That one, I'm saying, actually enjoy eating more, not less. You know, don't fight it. Don't. And, and the other thing is reconstitute your relationship to your body. You are your body's keeper. You're a parent to your own body. So act that way. Act like a, a, a loving parent rather than an abusive landlord. You know, take take good. So it's taking the same situation and asking you to see it from a new point of view. And that's the idea of the restructuring. Hypnosis is a matrix within, within which you can be more open to adopting a new point of view. But the restructuring is the new point of view. Uh, you know, one of the things that people who use hypnosis always say to their patients, and I said it to my patient yesterday, the worst thing you can say to somebody is don't think about purple elephant. You know, what are you going to think about? So you focus on what you're for. You want to come to a resolution of the problem that makes you feel good. It gives you intermittent positive reinforcement, not negative. I'm not depriving myself. I'm taking better care of my body. I can enjoy what I do eat more than I did before. So you focus on what you're for. Hmm. And this clearly relates to the notion of cognitive flexibility. And now that we've laid out what this principle of restructuring is, I can see how it relates to all of the instances of hypnosis that you've already described today, how it's operating in the background. Yes, that's exactly right. That it's a matrix within which these things can be, a, be more effective. But a question that this now raises for me is whether hypnosis has applications for more severe psychopathies like schizophrenia, for example, where maybe the patient's cognitive flexibility isn't the underlying factor that needs to be targeted for treatment. Well, you put it well, but it's, it's worse than that. It's cognitive inflexibility. You know, schizophrenia comes from the notion of a, a split between thought and affect. And and people who suffer from schizophrenia often have very rigid views. They have fixed delusions that don't make any sense, but try and argue one of them out of the delusion. They'll just say, oh, you're part of the system that's doing this to me. You know? So um, in general, unfortunately, people with schizophrenia, and we've studied this, they're half as hypnotizable as normal people as a group. They're, they're really not hypnotizable. Fascinating. Huh. Well, the the last question I have about hypnosis in general before we move on to reverie is we've been talking a lot about how it treats certain disorders. So eating disorders, for example, or post-traumatic stress disorder. But I wonder if it is also the sort of tool that can lead someone to very deep insights about themselves in the in the sense that a lot of talk therapy or psychoanalysis is geared toward or if it or if you you're using it primarily as a tool for treating um, disorders well i i use it primarily for symptom control but but yes um there are people who can come to some sort of profound new understandings of themselves. As one extreme example, I treat people with dissociative identity disorder, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. And you can use hypnosis to get them in, in touch to improve the communication among different elements of themselves in such a way that they see that they're, n they're not really different people. They just have, have difficult connections between one part of themselves and another. Uh, you know, you're different when you're out having a good time at a party than you are right now, hopefully. But um, you you experience the continuity of connection and the reasons for the shift, and they don't. So it can be sometimes very helpful in in building bridges. My <laughs> my one of my dissociative identity disorder patients said that I used crazy glue to try and uh, glue the parts of her together. Um, it can also help you restructure your understanding of yourself or what you do or why you do it, that people can 
see things in themselves that they may not have been able to admit or see before, like my patient who who was raped at age 12, um, that you, you can become aware of aspects of yourself that you previously had, you know, rejected or ignored or denied. And so, yes, it can be helpful. I'm guessing that it's quite similar in some ways to the MDA, MDMA you mentioned earlier with PTSD and that in increasing openness, you, it facilitates your ability to bring in things that you have repressed or like you, I think you just said things you wanted to ignore. And so it grants you more access to the material that needs to be changed or viewed differently for growth. Yes, that's, that's well put. It's, it's more sort of like non-judgmental awareness. You know, you, you, you know, you think through what they mean later, but you can just allow yourself to experience it, see what it means later. So that can be a very useful capacity. Okay, great. So yes, self-hypnosis. I would very much like uh, to turn now to reverie. And we mentioned it, or you mentioned it a bit at the beginning of the conversation, but it seems like from my end, like it's very much a modern tech or contemporary technological extension of one dimension of the work that you and your father believed in already in trans and treatment, which is teaching patients self-hypnosis. And is that largely why you decided to start working on the app? Well, uh, that's, that's yes, it's certainly, let me put it this way, that, that was sort of the necessary but not sufficient condition. It was necessary in that you have to believe that hypnosis is an, a widely distributed, naturally occurring trait, that people use it whether they're ever formally hypnotized or not. Uh, there are studies that show, measure, have a scale called absorption, Aki Telligan at Minnesota developed, showing that people who are more highly hypnotizable have spontaneous experiences of absorption in a movie or a play or lost, get lost in a sunset or something. So you know what? It happens out there anyway. There was a time when it was thought to be dangerous to allow people to hypnotize themselves, you know, and... A hundred years ago, when automobiles were invented and distributed, they were actually afraid to put windshield wipers on because they thought, you know, moving back and forth or the dangling watch, you know, well, it doesn't happen. So there was a time when I was worried about doing it, but I thought, you know what? I've used it with, I've used hypnosis with about 7,000 people. The number of problems, the uncontrollable problems that occurred is like I can count on the fingers of my left hand and they were all easily manageable. So I thought, you know what, right now while I'm talking to you now, I think I'm helping more people using reverie than I did like in six months of, of my person-by-person -person work. And I love my clinical work. I love doing it. I still do it as much as I can. But I thought, you know what, there have to be elements of this because it taps a naturally occurring trait, because people can change their perspective so easily. They'll know within a few minutes whether it's likely to help them or not. They cannot use this modern technology to distribute, to make it as widely available as possible. And that's what we've done with Reverie. So uh, we, what happened was about three years ago, so we had a mind-body, brain-body summit at Stanford, and I was giving a talk on hypnosis. And Ariel Poehler, who's an MIT grad, went to Stanford Business School, helped to start Strava, which is a terrific exercise app came up to me and said, hey, would you like to make an app that maybe helps people use hypnosis? And I said, sure. He said, well, you know, uh, uh, the Alexa now has this voice recognition software that can uh, be easily programmed. I can do it. So he said, "You want to? what do you want to work on? I said, let's help people stop smoking. I do that with hypnosis. So we built a stop smoking app. And uh, we used it. It used to. We used to do it through the Alexa system. Now we built our own app that works a whole lot more smoothly, and it's interactive. And then I ask a question: Is your hand floating up in the air? If you say yes, then I do give you one instruction. If you say no, I give you another one, and so on. So that it's more it personalized the way I do it in my office. And we found we got one out of five people to stop smoking just app. <laughs> My favorite in, in, the, in this one study, we had this uh, social worker who was one of one of the volunteers, and she said, I didn't even want to stop smoking. And when we tried it first in your office, I didn't like it. But that night, I did the exercise. I lit up a cigarette, and I said, who wants this? And I put it out, and I haven't had cigarettes since. 
I'm helping my friend stop. And she said to me, you know, this is some kind of crazy ass voodoo shit. And I mean that in a good way. She said, (laughs) and so, you know, people can surprise themselves. And I saw things like that and I thought, let's go for it. So we now have a team in reverie of about 14 staff. Uh, We're building and refining the apps. We help people with stress and pain and focusing attention uh, and uh, eating better and stopping smoking. And we're, we have a new one out on fear of flying. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun to see how people are doing. And we're finding that um, we get a 30, in 15 minutes, we get a 35% reduction in stress levels and in pain with people just using the app to do self-hypnosis. So you, the, the, the site, the app is called Reverie, R-E-V-E-R-I. We have a website, www.reverie.com, and you can download the app if you have an I, iOS phone from the App Store, if you have an Android from Google Play. And it's free for the first week. You can try it, see how you feel about it. Um, and we're excited by how people are responding. You know, we have users groups that are getting together now, and... Uh, it's it's fun. People surprise themselves. I love that they you know they uh, didn't realize how quickly they could get into a mental state that was the matrix for making real changes that improve their lives. Just how does the app work? Like say some say I download it. Uh, what happens next? You, you download it. You you get a series of brief instructions. You can test your hypnotizability. I do hypnotizability tests like I did with you on the app and you'll get feedback about how hypnotizable you are. And then you have a series of choices on the screen. Say, what's the problem you're most interested in doing something about? You want to control pain? Uh, Do you want to get to sleep? We have a lot of people that we were getting less feedback on the sleep app, how people did, you know, how sleepy you feel now because they just wanted to go to sleep. They didn't want to (laughs) push a number on the screen. So, uh, but it's the most popular app, actually, either falling asleep or staying asleep, uh, pain control, anxiety control. So you can choose a program. The program is immediately there. Uh, you hear my mellifluous voice giving you instructions, asking you questions. How are you doing? You tell me, then you'll get a different instruction depending on how you're doing it. The longest exercises take about 11 to 14 minutes. We also have little one minute refreshers where you can just kind of tune up. Uh, your reaction to the uh, to the problem that you're you're trying to deal with. So uh, it's easy to use, um, and uh, I hope that people will take advantage of it and use it to make their lives better. Yeah. So insomnia, both falling asleep and staying asleep, is one of my problems. So that's that's what I'm going to use the app for when I download it. Can you tell me just like what I should expect in in the sleeping exercise? Sure, sure. I give a few instructions about things to do to, you know, make your bedroom a quiet place where it's just work and play. And not work, but play and sleep uh, go on there. Work happens somewhere else. Uh, you keep it dark uh, at night. You don't have a clock you can see so that you're not, you don't wake yourself up by saying, oh my God, it's two in the morning. Um, and then I teach you to go into a state of self-hypnosis. And the way we did it together, look up, close your eyes, take a deep breath. And get your body comfortable. Focus first. And this we do this with stress management too. Before you deal with the stressor or the thoughts that are running through your head, just focus on making your body comfortable. Imagine you're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space. Each breath deeper and easier. Body floating safe and comfortable. And now that your body is feeling good, let the thoughts run through your mind as if you were watching a movie but outside yourself, outside your body. So your body is not reacting to any tension that is implicit in the thoughts and feelings you're having. So you dissociate your physical experience from your mental one, and you don't take ownership of, the, of what's in the movie. You just let it play out so that you don't, you're not engaged in a mentally active way in dealing with or solving the problem that the dream or thought is presenting to you. You're just letting it flow through you and get your body floating and comfortable. Hmm. Hmm. And then what I, what you you mentioned a statistic a few minutes ago, but like what sort of results should I or or the average person expect when they're doing this sort of thing with the sleep? Well, I, 
what we're finding is a lot of people find that they fall asleep much more easily and quickly. And if they wake up, they've got something to do. You know, rather than feeling, oh God, here I am, and God knows when I'll ever get to sleep. You're saying, okay, I have something I can do about this. And I don't have to get up to do it. If you need to, you know, I I used to think I wanted Reverie to be almost as good as being in my office. But I realize in some ways it's better because uh, if you've made an appointment and seen me in my office, I'm not going to be there in your bedroom at three in the morning to help you get back to sleep. But my voice is, my voice is on Reverie. You can hear me. And so in some ways it's better because you've got the interactive support you need to help yourself get back to sleep. But, you know, it's like with people with pain too. And they tell me that I had a patient the other day who had a bad gastrointestinal problems and pain. And she said, now when I have an attack of pain, I don't think I just have to lie there and take it or find some medication somewhere. I, I, I know what to do. I get my body floating. I feel a sense of warm or cool tingling numbness. I can filter the hurt out of the pain. So you feel less helpless and more in control of the experience. And that in and of itself is helpful. So you, I, I'm equipping you with tools that you have where you are whenever you need it. Well, there are, are two final things that I wanted to touch on about the app before we finish up. And one is how it does or should function in tandem with talk therapy or other modalities. Because I, I, I just, I hear a lot of, there are a lot of apps for meditation. Yeah. The podcat, uh, this is pins. She's the podcat. Yeah. She's, <laughs> I like that. She's um, joined us. There are lots of apps and things like this that sort of advertise themselves as um, fix-alls. I don't know if that's a phrase, but but, uh, panaceas, I suppose. But I'm also strongly of the opinion, and I'm sure you are as a psychiatrist yourself, that much of therapy comes from or much of the therapeutic benefit comes from developing a deep and meaningful relationship with somebody who is caring for you. And this is something that is sort of is absent from an app. So how do the, how do you envision these things um, working together? I, I, let me put it this way, Robinson. This may seem a little strange, but you're sort of right, but not entirely in that, um, you know, a part in any real relationship and certainly in any therape- therapeutic relationship, and I do this, it's my day job, you know, I do it for a living, is that you form and maintain and enhance relationships based not just on what I do as a therapist, but on what you bring to the therapy, what you allow me to do, the distortions you may have about me based on your early life experience, but also the things that you can learn to accept and appreciate from what you get in the relationship. So even in classical psychoanalytic psychotherapy, there's transfers. There's what the what you bring as a patient and what I bring as a doctor. And um, so there's no reason why some of those mechanisms can't happen with me as a symbolic doctor, that I'm there. Can you accept the fact that I'm really there trying to help? And I've, it may not always work, but but I'm, I'm well-meaning and trying to help make your life better. If you can accept that, if you can allow yourself to feel better, that's a step in the right direction. And I would say it also sets a set of expectations that if you have more complex problems, if you need to self-explore and understand more about yourself and how you got there, the fact that you can take a step in the right direction and feel, you know, when I do this, I actually help myself to feel better. You're improving your own self-esteem. It's an ability for you, but also your hope that being engaged in a psychotherapy will be similarly helpful. So it's uh, it's by no means competition with psychotherapy. It's a way of saying you can do things that will help yourself feel better, and one of them might be reverie, and one of them might be psychotherapy, and it might well be both. That's great. Another way then in which uh, hypnosis provides it's it's sort of like a window to uh, different or other therapeutic modalities it facilitates them that's right it does it can facilitate them and and it it gives you experience-based hope that what you're doing is going to make your life better 
And what I really love about Reverie is you'll know right away. If it's not going to help you, you give it a good try. If it doesn't, you know it. If it does, then within five or 10 or 15 minutes, you will feel different. And I've talked to people who do, who say they surprise themselves that they can make themselves feel so much better so quickly. And that's what's cool about it is that it's the the acid test is it happens right there in your window of experience. And if you have it, great. If you don't, fine, do something else or try it again another time. Uh, but it's it's kind of immediate feedback about how effective the tool is likely to be. Okay. And finally, you may have mentioned this, so I apologize if I missed it, but I know that I would be very interested in this and I'm sure there's a huge market for it, but does Reverie at all have any function for athletes or peak performance, these sorts of things, uh, productivity at work, otherwise? Yes. We, we, one of the apps is called Focus, and it's about helping people to prepare um, to, to, to use a state of self-hypnosis as both preparation and consolidation. So you can, if you just program yourself before you start a task, you know, part of the problem may seem overwhelming. So you use the hypnosis to say, well, what should I do first? What's the key problem here? What's my immediate goal? The one that I can do something about in the next hour. So you teach people to use the focus of hypnosis to avoid distractions and plan what you're going to do. And another exercise, and this is true for athletes too, and we are, we're preparing more for athletes, is to, to plan your method of attack, to plan, for example, I, I tell people in hypnosis to think of an opponent as a coach. Your opponent is teaching you what you need to know, how to deal with, with, with contests, um, how to, what to expect from an opponent, you know, whether you're playing tennis or wrestling or anything else. Uh, but to not see them as just a problem, an obstacle in the way, but see them as a teacher, someone who's teaching you how to be even better than you are. And then at the end, to consolidate what you've learned. So it, that's a very valuable period of time, the few minutes after an intense physical workout or something. How does my body feel now? What in the workout helped and what didn't? What can I do better? So if you plan it in advance and summarize it at the end, you can make more out of your training and uh, performance experience. Well, David, uh, even outside of the podcast, I think uh, this has been one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had. So thanks so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate your questions and your engagement and the fact that you read the book and uh, are taking it very seriously. And uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I wish you the best. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already smash all those buttons and also if you haven't followed me on uh twitter at robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as i eat my pint of ice cream on twitch at robinson Earhart on robinson eats please do so